I'm Kurt Thorne, and today I'm going to be talking about how to design a microscopy experiment. And in the lectures throughout this course, we've talked a lot about different types of microscopes and different techniques for optical imaging. And what I want to try and do today is share some general guidelines to put all this together and to give some advice about how to select from all the microscopes we've discussed, all the different kinds of imaging techniques we've discussed, and give some general guidelines as to when you'd want to choose one kind of microscope over another. This obviously isn't going to be a comprehensive overview of all the possible situations um, that one microscope would be a, appropriate over another, but hopefully I'll give you some general guidelines to think about when you are considering for your sample which microscope would be best used to acquire the kind of scientific data you want. Um, <clears throat> so just to give a brief overview here, a sort of a summary of the kinds of things we've talked about, modern microscopy is really, really diverse. And so you can see there's this large selection of imaging methods here. We've got very simple uh, microscopes like wide field where we don't have any special uh, optical properties beyond what just is in the objective. We've got sectioning techniques like total internal reflection, various kinds of confocal imaging, multi-photon imaging, and then we've got you know, more exotic techniques and newer techniques like super resolution uh, that's just coming coming into common usage now. <clears throat> and of course, there are many other kinds of imaging modalities I'm not discussing here, but these are sort of the, the general, most common ones. And then there's also a whole series of contrasting techniques, ways to get contrast in your sample. So there's, of course, bright field and variations on bright field imaging, things like phase contrast, differential interference contrast that just uses the native contrast, the native makeup of your specimen to generate an image. Then there are also molecularly specific ways to label your sample. So there's, of course, immunofluorescence, where we use antibodies, fluorescently labeled antibodies, to the uh, proteins or molecules in our sample to light up specific molecules. There are dyes that bind to membranes or to other compartments of the cell that we can image. And there are, of course, genetically encodable proteins like GFP and, and the related fluorescent proteins that we can use to genetically labeled proteins. And then there's also ways to generate contrast using light itself, techniques like photobleaching or photoactivation, and techniques that generate contrast based on the molecular properties of your sample, things like FRET energy transfer techniques, lifetime imaging, um, and other cases where the environment of the sample modifies the properties of the dyes. And these contrasting techniques can, in general, be used with any of the imaging modalities I mentioned on the previous slide. So you have this real mix and match kind of issue, you know, that I have, say, a section labeled with immunofluorescence and I need to choose an appropriate microscope or I have a cell line that's expressing some fluorescent proteins and I need to choose an appropriate microscope and you know what's the best way to do that. And finally to complicate things just a bit more there are even many kinds of experiments that you can then do with one of these samples on one of these microscopes. You know sometimes you'll be doing time-lapse imaging or video imaging you'll be trying to image you know a sample a cell line every 10 minutes for 12 hours or maybe you know, every 10 milliseconds for a minute, um, doing either fast or slow video imaging. You can be doing 3D reconstructions where you're, you need to acquire Z information uh, to build a three-dimensional rendering of your, your sample. Or you can be doing things like automated imaging in 96 well plates or other kinds of multi-point imaging where you need to visit many points in your sample and acquire data from many positions at once. And then, of course, you can be doing many wavelengths. You know, you can be doing multiple dyes, multiple different colors. <clears throat> So the first thing you really need to think about when you want to put together a microscopy experiment is what do you need to do? You really want to understand what your experiment is here. Um, and I'm just listing here a number of things that are sort of common things to think about. And probably the first thing is what resolution do you need? Are you trying to image whole cells? Are you trying to image organelles within the cell? Are you trying to image whole tissues? And Hand in hand with that is what field of view do you need? If you're trying to image something like the structure of the endoplasmic reticulum in a cell, you probably don't need to image a whole liver. Um, you would only be imaging one or a few cells at a time. Um, so that's the first thing to ask yourself is what resolution do you need? Are you trying to see small things or big things? And along with that, do you need 3D data? Is a 2D image good enough or do you need 3D? And similarly, if you're doing 3D, what kind of resolution in Z do you need? And going along with that, 
how deep in your sample do you need to image? Are you imaging a very thin yeast cell or a monolayer of tissue culture cells? Or are you imaging something like a brain slice or an organ explant from a mouse or even you know, an intact mouse trying to image into the brain or a lymph node of a mouse? Another question that will determine a lot of how you choose your microscope is, are your samples live or fixed? Are you looking at live cells and trying to see dynamics while they're living? Or are they fixed and stained and completely dead? Um, you know, if you're doing live imaging, you need to worry about issues like photo bleaching, phototoxicity, um, and similar things. Are you going to kill your cells by imaging them? Whereas if you're fixed, obviously, killing your samples is not a concern, um, and that eliminates some, some trade-offs that you might otherwise have to make. Of course, a critical question is, what dyes are you using? If you're looking at a fluorescently labeled sample, what dyes are you using? Are they you know, fluorescent proteins, are they antibodies, can you change them? You know, if you're doing immunofluorescence, it may be relatively easy to swap out dyes in case the microscope you have access to doesn't have a particular laser line to image, say, you know, Psi 5, you may be able to change to a different dye. If you have, say, tissues from a transgenic mouse expressing, you know, GFP and cherry, it may be a lot of work to change those dyes, and you really need to find a microscope that can image those particular dyes. Similarly, you want to know how fast you need to image. Are you trying to take video rate data and go very quickly and get movies of your sample in real time? Or are you doing long-term time lapse? Um, or are you just doing single time point imaging? And again, this will, there'll be trade-offs here as to what microscopes can go quickly or what microscopes have the facilities, say, for preserving cells, keeping them alive over 12 hours to do an overnight experiment, and holding focus over that time period. And then finally, there's the sort of grab bag thing at the bottom here, which is, are there special requirements for your cells? And that could be all kinds of things. That could be, you know, oh, I'm trying to do a FRET experiment, and so I need the right filter sets to do FRET. It could be, you know, oh, I'm trying to do a lifetime imaging experiment, so I need a lifetime imaging microscope. Um, you know, it could be I'm trying to do single molecule imaging, and I need to do single molecule stuff. Um, and so this just is some things you should think about before you uh, you know, start looking for a microscope and start planning your experiment. And if you have some idea of what your requirements are here, it'll make it much easier to choose an appropriate instrument to acquire your data. <clears throat> and so in the next uh, several slides, I just want to go through some of these briefly to discuss some of the trade-offs you'll want to think about in doing your imaging. So first off, resolution. Um, resolution is set by the objective of your microscope, so you often have a lot of control over this because most of microscopes have many different objectives. And as we've talked in, in other lectures, the um, resolution of the objective is just 0.61, the wavelength you're imaging at, divided by the NA of the objective. Um, and so for high resolution, you need a high NA objective, and that generally goes along with having a high magnification objective, so you can get enough, um, you can sample the data well enough with your camera. <clears throat> so I just am going to illustrate two hypothetical examples here. So imagine you're looking at cell-specific protein expression. You've got some transgene. You want to see, you know, is it expressed in this cell type or that cell type, say, in a tissue. You've got a tissue slice, and you want to know which cells in the tissue are expressing this um, protein. Then you don't need very high resolution. You just need enough resolution to separate one cell from the next. And so, you know, something like a one micron resolution might be sufficient uh, to get an image of this tissue where you can resolve individual cells. You don't need to see any subcellular detail here because in our hypothetical example, this protein is present uniformly throughout the cell. And so you'd say, you know, oh, a 10x 0.45 NA objective is probably sufficient. And that would give you a resolution of like 600, 700 nanometers, um, which is certainly sufficient to see single cells. Conversely, you might be trying to do something like image the mitochondrial shape and dynamics. And so you, now you want to image not just individual mitochondria, but you want to be able to see how large they are, what their length is, um, when they're fusing and, and fissioning. And this, you know, mitochondria are very small. They're a few hundred nanometers across. And so this pretty much means you need the highest resolution possible. So you would use something like a 100x 1.4 NA objective. Um, and here are just some images taken with these two different objectives to sort of show you graphically what the trade-offs are. And you can see here with this 10x 0.45 NA objective, you know, we've got a lot of cells in the field of view here. These are just some uh, fixed and stained tissue culture cells. You can see there's many of them filling this field of view, uh, but we don't get really high resolution images of any of them. If we then 
take the same sample and switch up to a 100x objective, now you can see that our field of view is much, much smaller. Um, in fact, it's 10 times smaller on each side. So we're imaging just 1% of the area as before. Um, and you can see that the cell here pretty much completely fills the field of view. But now you can see a lot more subcellular detail. So the green here are staining actin filaments. You can see these nice actin filaments, these stress fibers. And the red is staining mitochondria. And you can see all the mitochondria in these cells, which you couldn't see in the lower resolution image, the 10x image. Um, <clears throat> but in the 10x image, we got a lot more cells. So there's a, a trade-off here, right? If you're trying to do stuff where you don't need high resolution, in general, you'll want to stay with lower magnification, lower NA lenses, so you can get um, a bigger field of view and get more cells, get better statistics. But if you need to work at high mag and high resolution, you don't really have a choice there. You're going to have to accept the small field of view. Um, changing numerical aperture of your objective changes some other things as well. So as I mentioned, it increases your resolution. So increasing the NA increases your resolution. Um, increasing your NA also increases your Z resolution at a different rate. It goes up as the square of NA. So your Z resolution improves faster with increasing NA than your XY does. Um, and it also increases the light gathering power of your objective because the NA is just a measure of the cone angle of light you can collect. And so if you have a bigger cone angle, you can collect more light coming from your sample than if you have a smaller cone angle. So when you're choosing an objective, of course, you need to ask you know, what resolution you need, but you also may want to consider how bright your sample is. Um, and as I've said, for high resolution, you need high NA. There's no choice there. Um, but for dim samples, you might want to use a high NA uh, objective to maximize your light gathering power. Um, and in particular, if you have you know, dim, low resolution samples, like say you're trying to look at protein abundance in the nucleus or in the whole cell, you may want to use a high NA objective, but then bin your camera down so you can trade off resolution for brightness. Um, this is getting a little technical, but again, worth thinking about. You know? And of course, the downside here is, again, you'll lose field of view, so you'll have to take up many images to get good statistics. Um, so when do you want to use low NA? So if you uh, have bright samples at low resolution, that you know, you're not really trying to push the limits of the objective at all, so you can do this quite easily. Um, if you need long working distance, uh, low NA objectives are good. They have much more working distance, much larger clearance between the objective and the sample. So sometimes you need to use a low NA objective, for instance, if you were looking through tissue culture plates with plastic bottoms. Um, this is not great imaging ever, but you know, if for whatever reason your samples are constrained to that format, then you have no choice but to use a low NA objective. Um, <clears throat> Another more technical issue is if spherical aberration is a concern, um, using low NA will improve uh, your image quality, it will reduce your spherical aberration. And finally, another example is if you want to get low Z resolution, which means large depth of field, um, low NA is good. And, and low Z resolution, this large depth of field, means you can get whole structures. You'll get a big band of your sample and focus in, in, w at once. And that means you can avoid doing multiple Z slices through your sample. Um, and get an in-focus snapshot of a big, thick area in one, in one go. So here's an example of that. So imagine we wanted to record the total nuclear fluorescence. Say we were doing something like looking at transcription factor abundance in the nucleus. Um, so we want to record the total fluorescence of the nucleus. And if we use a, a high NA objective here, um, you know, we're going to get just this thin band here in focus at any one time. And that's only a small chunk of the nucleus. So in order to actually image, to measure the amount of fluorescence in the whole nucleus, we'll have to move you know, these steps through the nucleus to get a bunch of sections, each of which captures a different region of the nucleus in focus. However, if we switch instead to a low NA objective, now our depth of field gets much larger. And in fact, we can capture the whole nucleus in focus in a single section. Um, the trade-off here, of course, is that this objective has lower light gathering power. So your image will be dimmer. It will not be as bright. But if your fluorescence from the nucleus is, is reasonably intense, this may be a faster and more efficient way to collect data because you don't need to do z-stacks and then worry about processing all this 3D data. You can get a single 2D image that has all the information you need. <clears throat> so that brings us to thinking a little bit about 3D imaging. So conventional wide field microscopy, normal epifluorescence with just a uh, single objective and no fancy optics, gives you both in-focus and out-of-focus light. And as I've talked about in our confocal lecture and multi-photon lecture, there are techniques you can use to 
prevent this, this out of focus light from being collected from reaching the detector. Um, and in confocal, you use a pinhole to block that out of focus light. In multi-photon microscopy, you don't excite it at all. Um, and both of those techniques give you a single section that only has in focus light. There's also techniques that let you remove that out of focus light after the fact, such as deconvolution. Um, so if you are doing 3D imaging, you need to think about you know, whether you can get by with having some out of focus light captured, or if you need to use one of these techniques that will prevent you from either seeing the out of focus light or remove it. Um, and so here's just an example. This is a conventional wide field microscope image of a, of a tissue section. And you can see you know, it's a little bit fuzzy looking because there's both you know, sharp things that are in focus in here, but also blurry stuff out of focus. If we now use a confocal to image that same area, we see a, you know, a much um, improved contrast here because we're removing a lot of the blurry out of focus light and just getting this nice sharp in focus information. Uh, so if you are doing 3D imaging, particularly if you're looking at thick samples, you need to think about whether you want this kind of uh, confocal technology to remove the out-of-focus light or if you can get by with a conventional wide field system and that the out-of-focus light won't be too much of a problem. It's very hard to give absolute rules about when to use one technique versus the other, um, but in general, I would say for thick samples, something like 10 times the depth of field of the objective, it's worth considering using confocal, or this is maybe where confocal starts to become uh, significantly better than epifluorescence. Uh, as I mentioned in the confocal lecture, there are a number of different types of confocal, and spinning disk confocal works better with live samples due to increased sensitivity, in part. Um, <clears throat> One common misconception about confocal is that it doesn't improve resolution for over wide field. So if you have a thin sample, the confocal image and the wide field image will basically be the same. So there's no benefit to using confocal if you're imaging a thin sample. And finally, despite the fact that confocal in general has lower sensitivity than wide field, the reduced out of focus light in confocal can improve the contrast for dim samples. So what that means is even if your samples aren't bright, you may still be better off using confocal if they're moderately thick because in a wide field system, you'll collect more light, but the out of focus light may obscure the in focus information you want since it's dim. Um, so using a, a confocal here, particularly something like a spinning disk confocal that's relatively sensitive, you may get an improved contrast and be able to actually see your dim samples better than you could on a wide field system. Um, there's a nice paper here that discusses uh, in great detail the relative sensitivity of these different instruments. Um, but these are, this is just sort of a general guideline from that paper of what they find in sensitivity that, you know, wide field systems are about four times more sensitive than spinning disk um, and about a hundred times more sensitive than laser scanning confocals. Um, this was done, you know, several years ago now, so the laser scanning confocals are relatively old and newer systems may not be quite as bad, um, but I'm not aware of a more recent uh, measurement of this. So which confocal do you want to use? If your samples are live, generally you want to use spinning disk, I think. Um, you may also want to consider resonant laser scanning confocal. Uh, these have been also seen to work well on live samples. If your samples are really thick, something like a you know, tissue explant from a mouse or a live mouse, then two photon really shines um, when you're trying to image into thick specimens. For fixed samples, generally you would start with a laser scanning confocal. Um, sensitivity isn't as much a concern here because of, we don't have nearly as much concern about photo bleaching and, and phototoxicity as a non-issue. Um, and again, for really thick specimens, you would probably consider using two photon. These are general guidelines, and you know, if you have access to both types of microscope, you may want to consider trying both to see which one works best. <clears throat> I want to briefly mention one technique, uh, a related optical sectioning technique that's total internal reflection. Um, there's a whole lecture in this course on it. Um, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly. What it does is give you 100 nanometer sections adjacent to the cover slip. Um, and this is obviously good for samples located at the cover slip. If you're looking at something interior to the cell, like the nucleus, it doesn't work at all. Um, but if you're looking at something like membrane dynamics, membrane trafficking, um, endo or exocytosis of proteins at the membrane, this works great because all you see is the membrane that's adjacent to your cover slip. Um, it also works well for looking at things in the cell cortex, so actin immediately underlaying the cell membrane, 
um, other proteins that are just on the interior of the cell membrane. And it also is a real workhorse for single molecule biophysics where you're looking at um, in vitro sort of prepared samples and you can anchor them to the glass to get very good imaging of them. Here's a relatively old image just demonstrating what TERF does. So here's an epifluorescence image of some cells uh, that have been induced to uptake uh, FITC dextran via endocytosis. And you can see these little puncta throughout the cells, and particularly there are these bright clusters inside the cells. If we now switch to TERF, um, you see that all that stuff on the interior of the cell disappears, and the signal to noise really increases. We get much better contrast here of these little uh, specks in the background, these little vesicles that are close to the cover slip, whereas all the stuff in the interior of the cell goes away. So if you do happen to be looking at something that can be made to be adjacent to the cover slip, um, you know, within 100 nanometers of the cover slip, turf is really the way to go. <clears throat> so finally, I want to talk about some, you know, quote unquote, trivial issues. So I, I, you know, these are trivial in the sense that they are um, you know, not really sample dependent and not complicated, but that doesn't mean they're not important. Um, in fact, they're sort of critical. And so, you know, one of these trivial questions is what laser lines and filter sets are available on the scopes you have access to? And do they match your dye? So, you know, if you're trying to image, say, Psi 5, and none of the microscopes you have has a Psi 5 channel on it, you're not going to get very far. Similarly, if you're trying to do CFP, YFP, FRET, and none of your scopes has a CFP, YFP filter cube on it, you're you know, not going to be able to do your experiment. So um, particularly if you don't have access to a wide range of microscopes, you know, a critical question is what laser lines or filter sets are available? Do they match the dyes you want? And if they don't, can you switch your dyes? Or can you get additional lasers or filter sets for your microscope? <clears throat> um, and particularly you know, if, you're, if you are in a a lab that doesn't have access to a lot of microscopes, it may be worth considering this up front when you're planning an experiment to see if you can design an experiment that will work well with the scopes you have, rather than you know, have to spend extra money, particularly if you're on a confocal and you need to buy extra laser lines. This can be you know, tens of thousands of dollars to add them. <clears throat> Similarly, if you're doing live cell work, do you have a microscope that can keep your cells alive? Does it have temperature, CO2, and humidity control? Um, you know, if you're doing mammalian cell work, you need all of these. If you're doing other organisms, you maybe just need temperature and humidity control um, to keep your sample from warm and keep it from evaporating. Um, but whether or not you have a microscope that can keep your sample happy is also you know, a critical issue here. Um, also, how fast can your microscope acquire images? If you're trying to do video rate imaging of you know, vesicle mo motion inside the cell or you know, cell migration or protein dynamics in the cell, and you only have a scope with a camera that can take images every half second, you know, this is really not going to cut it. Um, so this is, again, sort of an issue of technology, what technology is available to you, and does it meet the needs of your experiment? And finally, um, you know, um, an issue that's come um, to the fore more recently is the availability of hardware or software autofocus for doing long time lapses. Um, if you're doing single you know, images, this doesn't really matter. But if you are trying to do a overnight time lapse, most microscopes will drift out of focus over that time period unless you either have an extremely stable, very well temperature controlled environment for your microscope, or if you have some hardware or software technique um, that will hold focus. Most of the manufacturers now make a hardware system for autofocus. Those are really nice because they don't require very much intervention on your part. They track something like the cover slip of your sample um, or some other feature inside the sample in hardware and feedback to hold focus. Um, if you have one of those, it makes doing long time lapses much, much easier. <clears throat> if you don't, there are software options which are generally image-based where you use a computer system to take photos of your sample at different focal planes and then it evaluates which one is in the best focus and will adjust the focus to hold that um, in the center of your image. Um, that is not quite as ideal as the hardware system, partly because it's slower and partly because it exposes your samples to more light, which tends to lead to phototoxicity, but um, is still better than having your sample drift out of focus during the course of your experiment. Um, so these are all sort of hardware issues that you should consider when setting up your, your experiment as to whether you have access to the, the hardware that's going to 
either make your experiment possible or make it easier. <clears throat> um, another big set of issues is sample preparation here. And this is really a much larger topic than I can cover in this one lecture here. Um, but just to highlight some of the critical issues here, you know, if you're doing fixed um, samples, does your fixation and mounting procedure preserve the localization of your protein? Um, so there are a bunch of different ways you can fix samples. There are a bunch of different ways you can mount them. And it's not guaranteed that fixing you know, with formaldehyde will preserve the localization of your protein. Um, similarly, if you're doing GFP tagging or fluorescent protein tagging, it's not guaranteed that your fluorescently tagged protein will behave the same as the native protein. And so, um, it's often best if you can use both techniques to look at your protein um, to rule out that one or the other is introducing artifacts. Um, and another issue for sample preparation is if you're doing fixed specimens that are thick, you know, 100 micron brain sections or similar um, types of prep preparations, you want to consider something called clearing. And this is generally passaging your samples through some solution, which can either be um, uh, something like xylene or benzyl alcohol that dissolves out lipids, or these newer um, reagents like the scale system from Miyawaki's lab. And what these are are chemical treatments of your sample that reduces the light scattering and the opaqueness of the sample and makes it much clearer and easier to image into, into it um, into a thick specimen. Um, and this can really make the difference between being able to image just you know, 20 or 30 microns into a sample or being able to image you know, 100 or 200. Um, so, you know, this sort of goes along with fixing and mounting, um, but uh, is definitely worth considering for um, thick specimens, um, thick fixed specimens. Obviously, these techniques aren't applicable to live specimens. <clears throat> um, another issue which I touched upon a little bit is dye choices. Um, for fixed samples, a very common filter set is this quadruple um, dye set, this so-called Sadat quad set. Um, which would do DAPI, fluorescein, Psi-3 or rhodamine, and then Psi-5. Um, and there are you know, a number of different dyes out there. There are many different dyes out there that will work with a set like this. Um, obviously, in your DAPI channel, there's DAPI and Hooks dyes. There's also these Alexa dyes. There's some newer uh, dyes that also fall on this channel for doing antibody labeling. Um, in the green channel, you pretty much never want to use fluorescein. It's a very old dye. It photo bleaches rapidly. Um, something like Alexa 488 is much better. There are probably equally good dyes from other companies now. Um, in the red channel, you can use rhodamine or Alexa 546 or 568. Um, and in the far red channel, you have you know, Psi 5, Alexa 647, or this Addo 647 dye. Um, you can do more than four colors, um, but it's challenging still on, on most microscopes. So for routine imaging, it's, it's certainly easiest if you can design your experiment to only need four dyes. Um, it's absolutely possible to do more than four, but it may require you know, some special hardware or um, thinking a lot about your data analysis procedures to make sure there's no crosstalk. <clears throat> On the fluorescent protein side, um, you can use a very similar set for live cell imaging now. And um, you can use a blue fluorescent protein, a green fluorescent protein, a red fluorescent protein, and then an infrared fluorescent protein. Um, and what is sort of seen to be the best right now is um, you know, things like MTAG BFP2 um, in the blue fluorescent protein channel. That, um, this is a new, very new variant of MTAG BFP, which is also quite good. Um, for GFP, you have the old standby EGFP, which is very good. Um, some more modern versions like Emerald. Um, for the reds, there's MCherry as sort of the, the standby. Newer things like TAG RFP are maybe better. Um, there are a lot of RFP variants out there, and it's not completely clear right now which one is best. And mo most recently, there are now infrared fluorescent proteins um, that work in the, the Psi 5 channel. So there's this protein IFP 1.4 and a newer one called IRFP. Um, these actually use a cofactor to, to generate fluorescence. So they're a little trickier to work with than the uh, three up here, but um, are still a good choice for, for live cell imaging. And I know a number of people doing this kind of four color imaging routinely in live cells. <clears throat> Uh, a couple other points to make. So um, we could talk a lot about noise and resolution. Um, and I don't want to go into the technical details here, but just want to say that 
high resolution imaging as well as precise quantitation, basically any place where you're trying to make very accurate intensity measurements, um, require a lot of light. Um, so you want to, you need very bright images to reduce the uh, photon shot noise in your image to a point where you can get both high resolution and precise quantitation in your image. And this means that either your samples need to be very bright intrinsically, or if they're not very bright, you're going to need to use long exposures. Um, and if you are in this regime where you need to use long exposures, you need to worry about problems with photo bleaching and phototoxicity. Um, so, you know, if you're doing a Z stack in a fixed sample and you find that your fluorescence is kind of gone um, by the time you get all the way through it because you've bleached it all, that's a problem. Similarly, if your cells are dying due to light exposure over the time course of your experiment, that's a problem as well. Um, so, there's no magic bullets here. There are, um, particularly for fixed samples, mounting media that will reduce photo bleaching. Um, for live cells, there's many fewer things you can do, although there are some reports of additives you can add to cell culture to reduce photo bleaching. Um, but in general, the only solution here is just to reduce the amount of light that you're exposing your samples to. Um, so there are you know, potential trade-offs here between precision, speed, um, photo bleaching, and also how long you can image for. So you know, if you're trying to image very fast, you can't use long exposures. Um, if you're trying to get very precise images, you may need a lot of light, which will prevent you from going fast. It may also lead to photo bleaching problems, um, which will prevent you from imaging as long as you'd like, say. Um, so this is just something to be aware of. If you're trying to image you know, at video rate for overnight, it's probably not going to work just because of the amount of light you're going to have to expose your cells to. Whereas if you're trying to image every half hour overnight, then you'll probably have much better luck um, in not killing your cells with the light you're shining on them. So, you know, not everything you want to do may be possible. You may run into fundamental limitations that prevent you from getting the data you want. <clears throat> um, finally, I'd say, you know, nothing beats good data. Um, this is, you know, something to think about. And, you know, it really means you should think about what data you need before you take it. And if you're taking, you know, video rate data just because you can, um, but you don't really need that time resolution. And because you're, you're shining all this light on your cells, you're getting photo bleaching and phototoxicity issues that's reducing, say, the accuracy of your data, that doesn't really help you. Um, so you really want to think about what data you need before you take it and you know, not take data that is unnecessary in some way and may compromise the things you really care about. Um, so you, know, you should think about if you need time resolution. Do you need high speed? Do you need high spatial resolution? Do you need high intensity resolution, the ability to do precise uh, intensity quantification? Also things like, do you need day-to-day -day reproducibility? Are you going to be trying to compare samples, the intensity of samples, from one day to the next? Maybe you know, from different experimental batches or you know, different lots of mice or something? Um, and you know, similarly, do you need spatial uniformity? Um, and particularly these last two, if you need something like day-to-day -day reproducibility, you're going to need to think a lot about including appropriate controls and internal standards in your imaging procedure to compensate or measure um, any variations in the intensity of the microscope. So you know, things like lamp intensity and camera sensitivity will drift over time. Um, and if you don't have a way to accurately measure that and correct for it, you're going to have much worse day-to-day -day reproducibility than if you include those kinds of controls. Um, and so you, know, you can fix a lot of these things in post-processing, right? You can take data that's not perfect and work out ways to figure out these corrections after the fact. But your data will almost always be better if you put the work in ahead of time to think about how to collect your data best and you know, what kinds of controls you need to include and which things you care about and, and design your experiment to maximize the things you care about. <clears throat> um, and you know, something that goes along with that is what I always tell people, you know, if you care about something enough to worry about it, you should figure out how you can measure it. Um, you know, and so I often see people asking me, well, oh, is the, you know, the intensity uniform across the field of view of this microscope? You know, can, I, can I accurately compare a cell in the lower, lower right corner to one that's in the upper left corner? Or are they going to have different brightnesses? And, you know, my answer is often, well, I can tell you what I think, but you know, if you, this is really important to you, you should measure it um, because you know, what I know may be out of date or not accurate. Um, and so just you know, two general things. So in general, microscopes are not uniform over the field of view. Both 
the illumination intensity and the detection efficiency are not uniform over the field of view of the microscope. These can be measured and corrected um, by looking at a uniform fluorescent sample, something like a fluorescent plastic slide or a uniform solution of dye. Um, so there are ways to measure these things um, and correct for them. And if, if this is important to you, you should measure them and correct for them. One caveat here is if there's photo bleaching in your sample, this may not be so trivial. Um, so bear that in mind. And similarly, uh, temporal uniformity. So well, things like lamp power, laser power, the alignment of your lamp and your laser, they're going to fluctuate from day to day. And that means the amount of light reaching your sample will fluctuate from day to day. This can be, you know, a 10 or 20 percent effect. It's not, it's not gigantic, but it's not small. Over the course of months, this can be more like a two-fold effect. Um, you know, we often see that our lasers on our spinning disk confocal drift out of alignment over months, and when we realign them, the power goes up by two-fold. Um, so you shouldn't rely on these things being stable from day to day if that's important to you. You should you know, include in your experiment some kind of control samples that will let you assess you know, how bright the microscope is in that experimental session. Um, so you can measure this, but of course you'll get the best data if you do all your experiments on the same day and the same session. That's not always possible, um, so that's when you want to include an internal control that lets you um, measure that and assess it. Um, there are other sorts of things like this, but these are probably the two major sources of, of non-uniformity you want to think about. Um, so that's all I have to say today. I just wanted to, uh, you know, hopefully I've shed some light on the kinds of things you want to think about when designing a microscope experiment and given you some uh, ballpark uh, ideas as to how to choose a microscope. Thank you. <laughs>